how these spaces very much discipline a certain type of viewership, how these, how the architecture in particular presents our bodies in, in space in a certain way that we are asked to look and interact um, with art and other objects differently depending on what type of institution we we are doing and so we're going to talk about that in the first half and then the second half we're really going to think about well ways in which museums are trying to change certain traditional um, means of, of disciplining behavior and trying to be a bit more interactive with audiences and communities so you will be able to answer and discuss the following questions. Does behavior change in, mu in museum um, and in front of artworks within different types of institutions? And I'm really gonna call upon you guys to really think about your experiences with museums or natural history museums and think of yourself, like do, do you act differently? Um, have you noticed that you act differently in different environments? Uh, second, does appreciating art in museums invoke a passive citizen, citizenry? And so this builds upon the question that I asked you last time on whether or not you think that museums have an ideal citizen or an ideal viewer in mind when they organize exhibitions, when they hang artworks, right? And so this question built upon that is, does that make you passive? Are, are, are you as an audience in an art museum, are you asked to be passive and not active? And then last, what is the end goal for increasing participation and interactivity in museums? This last part is, is also very open-ended. In my own research of museums, um, because it is a, uh, it is a interest of mine, um, there is this idea that just adding interaction, just adding participation in an exhibition will ameliorate, it will help all of the problematic aspects of uh, these types of institutions and their history and their, and their design. And so that's a question for you guys on whether or not at the end of this lecture, you think that that's the end, that's the end, that's, that's just what you do and, and, and if it works or not. Once again, no, no wrong answer to that question. I'm very interested in what you guys think. <clears throat> so to begin, a little bit of a review. Here we have an image from 1895, an old image of the Brooklyn Museum in New York City. And this is another example of one of these big survey museums that were built during the, the 1800s that took ancient Greece and ancient Rome, uh, especially the architecture as uh, inspiration for how to how to build um, these big cultural institutions. And we talked about how it really symbolized the time, uh, the 1800s, the, the view that knowledge should be for the people and that serving the people is important, but also a huge symbol of power, a power of, of a culture and the power of its art and the power of what narratives lie inside, right? How, how is art history designed by the actual objects? Where, where are the, where is art from Europe? Where is art from um, the US? Where is art from other places, say South America, Africa, etc.? What is play, uh, uh, so the, is, uh, these types of museums, there's a lot of very active practices um, on how to design um, an institution to really bolster the idea of power and authority of, of that culture itself. <clears throat> so let's take a look inside, right? It's not just the outside of a building that conveys power, but how the actual galleries are organized also reflects this. And this is the floor plan of the ground floor of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's a really wonderful museum. Um, yeah, I know I'm very, I, I may seem very critical, um, but I, I love going to museums and I feel like I'm critical because I, I love them so much and I'm very invested as an art historian in these sort of questions. And you can just get lost in the Metropolitan. It's another one of those, those uh, museums that you need multiple days 
to to be there you know it's the site of you know the met gala every year which um you know a lot of people like looking at the fashion there but <clears throat> Well, actually looking at, you know, the, the floor plan, the, you have the Great Hall is, is the main entrance, right? So you, have, you are immediately hit with the grandeur, this big open space that leads you in three different directions that you can choose. And often enough, they'll have signs that say, hey, if you're interested in medieval art, if you're interested in Egyptian art, a lot of people like going into the Egyptian art uh, section first, um, or Greek art, right? But they had to design this, right? Why Egyptian art here? Why Greek art here? Why medieval art here? And most importantly, you know, why do we have very separate galleries for very discrete cultures? But then when we are thinking about, well, what is outside of the US? What is outside of Western Europe? Well, we just put it all, we just smash it all in just one gallery space and just call it the arts of Africa, Oceania, and the Americas. And so what I'm getting at here is that art of Western Europe in particular gets the most and best gallery space that is easily accessible. They are the spaces that you as a, an audience, you, you are kind of forced a, a little bit. You have a choice to go this way, that way, or that way, but you really don't have a choice on the narrative, right? Um, of, uh, it's very difficult. If, if, what if you wanted to say, hey, I want to go see Arts of Africa? Well, you, there's no direct line there. You have to actually walk through all of these other galleries to get there. Um, and that gives incredible meaning to, you know, the art of, of, of one culture versus the art of another. And so usually, you know, Asia, Africa, Oceania, which is, um, Oceania is off the coast of, of Australia, where Papua New Guinea, et cetera, indigenous Americas. Well, they're situated on the edges and sometimes even tucked into corridors and back galleries. I've been into museums where it is very, very difficult to even get, uh, get to, um, art that's not the U.S. and, and Europe. And sometimes you just come upon it and you, you say, oh, wow, this is really interesting, but why, why is this put here? Well, it's, it's about value. It's about authority. It's about presenting an idea that Western art is superior. Western art is the logical, right, in this mind view, uh, successor of you know, these, these great civilizations, the Greeks, the Romans, the Egyptians, um, but also as the Met, as this very, as it, it, the Met likes to see itself because it's situated in New York City as sort of this flagship survey museum that really represents the U.S. Um, um, as a whole. So all of this is, is funneled into the idea that U.S. art, um, which, you know, has a legacy to, to, to European art is most, is most important. And not just where objects come from and what, and, and not just the history that is being created by curators and, and the designers of the galleries, but also the types of objects. So we also have a value statement about what is, what is considered better art, painting, sculpture, or what about, what about other media? What about craft uh, or the decorative arts? Well, typically painting is given priority over sculpture. Um, the functional and decorative arts and other media are even below that. And so, um, you, and you can see that here, that this, once again, just like the arts of Africa, Oceania, and America, the European sculpture and decorative arts are just kind of smushed into one, one little gallery. <clears throat> and we see that, um, even, even still in, in art history, a lot of people still study painting over sculpture um, and, and craft practices. And then there's us, right? We, we are interacting in the museum. We, we have choices, but a lot of the times we don't. And that's what I'm getting at in this first portion is that we these types of museums, there isn't a lot of interaction or participation other than you being there 
and looking, right? And the, there's a primacy of you looking at objects one by one. And that's why often enough, there's always a bench nearby for the, the wary uh, museum goer who just can't stand um, anymore. And I'm someone who's like that. I, I usually move pretty fast through museums because I have, a, I have a hard time just standing. I get very tired out. And there's not, it, it is not a coincidence that there is a similarity between the Universal Survey Museum. So once again, the, the, the Universal Survey Museum, the goal is to present a vast history to the public, starting from prehistory all the way to present day. Um, it's very much like picking up a art history textbook, um, but in a visual form. And so the Met is a universal survey museum, the Louvre in Paris is a, a universal survey museum, but it's, it's not a coincidence that they take the form, they look like temples, like Greek and Roman temples and other types of ritual monuments, because the design not only presents this idea of power and the civilization, but it, think about how you act in a religious space. You, you, you approach the space in a very solemn, very reserved, reverent manner. You're not out of control in, in a church, a temple, a, a synagogue, right? You, you are respectful. You, you try to look nice. You, you are paying attention to your behavior. And this is the type of bodily behavior that a lot of people have in Universal Survey Museums that you, you are reserved, you, you aren't running around, you're not talking too loud. And a lot of scholars have really been fascinated with, with how space, how space can do that to bodies. And especially for museums as being secular spaces, they aren't religious, but the fact that they take the form of a religious building that it, it, it sparks something in us. And what is it saying? It's saying that uh, the history that you're looking at is also reverent and you need to respect it and it is an authority over you. And so when, so this picture, which I love, I love, I love images of people looking at very famous artworks. Um, I, I also really like watching people interacting with artworks, but not in a creepy way, I promise. I just, I just think it's just very interesting for me uh, to observe. But this is a very famous painting by Gustave Courbet, a burial at Ornans, and we have someone just staring at it. And usually artworks are one by one, right? This is a huge painting, so it, it, it takes up its own uh, wall space, but typically you would have, you know, it, it's linear, right? You're not, you don't have things grouped together chaotically. And so what that, what, what that's doing is that historical narratives, whatever, whatever the curators are deciding it is, unfold by and through the sequence of space and how we move through space. And, and the fact that it wants you, the, the design wants you to be very respectful and quiet and reverent you are spending a lot of time absorbing that historical narrative one frame at a time. And so a meaning is being subliminally put into your mind about how you should think about these things. Um, maybe you don't really, maybe you, you look at an artwork and you are very curious, at, you, you're like, I don't really like this or Maybe it unsettles you, but the fact that it's on a wall and it's in a gallery makes you think, well, maybe I, well, I should, I feel bad about that. I, I, I'm, I'm not really into this art, but I feel bad because it is in such a reverent space. And not only is our artworks put in sequential order, creating a sense of timeline and history that you need to look at one by one, we also have text labels. We have text labels next to each artwork that gives some information that the curator has designed for, for you to, to look if you are interested. But then each gallery typically has a bigger wall text that's giving you a summation of what's happening in, in, in the room visually. 
And so the words are matching the, 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 the visual narrative. Um, and so you, you, can, you can read them. Uh, I, I am someone who, I don't really like reading a lot of wall text in, in galleries because I feel um, that it, it guides my own interpretation, my own personal experience of the work. And I, and I rather really, I rather prefer to look at works and create my own um, judgment and, and argument. Um, but, you know, a lot of people really, really like that to, to read that history of, you know, American art and what's going on. But all in all, um, just to sum up what I've been talking about is that the visual narrative, the text narrative, and the movement of bodies as disciplined by the actual space in the galleries creates a version of a, a certain version of art history that becomes unconsciously ingrained. And this can be a little bit problematic, right? Because you're not really giving audiences a great deal of of movement in, in in what they think right you you're or um what about um community right you, you're presenting artworks from other places it's 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 very distant it's how how can it's not very relatable um to to actual audiences and but the, but we've been talking about uh, primarily you know large survey museums but it also history museums, natural history museums do this uh, um, as well, but differently. And this is, this is where I, I would really love to hear from you guys about whether or not you feel that if, if you've had that experience of being in a more traditional gallery space and then being in a natural history, if do you move differently? Do you notice that other people move, move differently? And so if you haven't, I, I have these two images of, of people interacting within these spaces. Natural history museums are built to be a lot more interactive in the sense that you have children running around. They can, they can step up on platforms to get closer to these wonderful mammoth skeletons. The, the way that information is presented in natural history museums tends to be a, a little bit more built around education and especially tactile things. I've been to natural history museums where you may not be able to touch um, an actual fossil, but they have replicas right in front of it for, for you know, a very, very much geared towards, towards children and young adults, but I like, I like it as well. But you can touch things and you can interact things. And, um, you know, I've been to ones too where they show you how, you know, oil is made and, and, you, and there's something very tactile and interactive. Very different, right? There, it's, it, and it allows the, hu the human body and children's bodies to, to express themselves a little bit more. And, and there's this sense of, awe and discovery that oh, I'm finding out new things out in this space versus this space. It's, it's like you aren't finding new things out. The wall in the image are telling you what to think. Um, a, a lot of scholars who are really interested in museums um, have talked about how um, th 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 this, is a, this is a purposeful um, difference, right? This is why you don't see mammoth skeletons within art art museums because there's this idea of hierarchy right that yes this, you know a natural history museum is important for education um but it's seen as as kind of a less of an art form to painting and sculpture and um these sort of things and hopefully my discussion of the natural history museum as it is today reminds you of what I talked about last time uh, uh, on the about cabinets of curiosities and we can see natural history museums as very much more modern uh, versions of cabinet of curiosities, especially that sense of tact uh, being tactile. So these these cabinets, you could pick things up, you could stare at it and it was really about in invoking that sense of wonder and awe about 
um, the, the, the natural world. And so natural history museums very much um, are catering to that idea versus art museums are very much their legacy goes back to, if you remember, those princely collections, the, the collections of wealthy people who collected paintings and sculptures and they put it in their, in their private homes. Um, it's much more of that history. But let's think about how museums want to change because there is a lot of institutions that realize that they don't give audiences a lot of chances to interact with the art or interact in a, in a more free way within the actual museum design itself. And a lot of museums have, have done big remodels over the years. Some of them have even left old buildings and made brand spanking new facilities. And um, the Studio Museum in Harlem is, is one of these types of institutions. And because a remodel allows you to really think about how you can change space to make it more audience friendly, um, more interactive with its local space, right? The city street, uh, the neighborhood. And so, the the studio museum they wanted to redesign the lobby space the entrance and they cre and the designers created this idea of a reverse stoop right a stoop as in like um you know you, you, the stoop outside of a front door you know which, which in in neighborhoods especially in cities where you don't have backyards um the stoop is a very social communal space people hang out on stoops hey i'll meet you on the stoop and we'll hang out you know, we'll have a barbecue. And so it really wanted to capture that, that urban use of the stoop as a, as a place of community for the actual lobby. But, but a reverse stoop means that it's not outside, it's inside. And so the new building's designed um, centered uh, on this concept of, of this reverse stoop uh, for neighborhood residents and visitors alike. So it wasn't just catering to tourists, it wanted to cater to and be meaningful to the people living nearby. And so, like I said, it was inspired by Harlem, Harlem's ubiquitous brownstone stoops. Um, and it invites the public to step down from street level into a lively multi-use venue. So we have a cafe, and this is you know, just a kind of a, a digital mock-up of of the uh, the architectural um, ideas, and so you have you know people can sit on on these wonderful little pads, so it's very comfortable, uh, very much like a stoop. You can talk, you can bring your lunch, you can go on a lunch break, um, and because uh, lobbies you don't have to pay to get into the lobby, you can just hang out. You can have coffee, you can sit, meet up with friends, you can read. Um, plug in your phone, plug in your computer, work on schoolwork, whatever. And so this is a great example of how, you know, that lobby space is, is a way of connecting with an audience and making the, the actual institution less of this authority that is basically saying, here, um, uh, we know more than you and we are funneling you through different galleries. No, it's thinking about audiences and communities. The Whitney is also another institution that had a huge, uh, huge redesign. It actually left its historic building, and a lot of people were really sad about it because it's a really, this really beautiful brick building. Um, but they wanted to make a bigger museum. They, had their, they, their collections didn't fit anymore in the old building, and they did an entire new design that was built to interact with people and who live in New York City but also tourists, but also other public spaces that uh, are around the Whitney. And the Whitney, uh, maybe some of you have heard of the, the High Line. The High Line is not, is not a project uh, that the Whitney did, but it was another, this, this kind of a means of making the city, it's Manhattan, which is very busy and there's a lot, a lot of traffic, uh, a little bit more walk, 
walker friendly, pedestrian friendly. And so the High Line, they turned an old, the old, an old above ground um, uh, rail, railway system that was defunct and just kind of deteriorating. And they are turning it slowly into this entire uh, um, floating sidewalk. And there's a lot of gardens up there in different places. A lot of public art is put in there. It's a very popular place for people because you don't have to worry about getting run over by a taxi <laughs> um, or a bicycle. And um, so the High Line runs right next to the new Whitney, um, which we see uh, just a, a little snippet of it here. And so the Whitney knew this. And so they made extensions, these porches and porticos that are coming off of gallery spaces that, um, are, are, that, it, that actually connect in different ways to the High Line. And so it's a way in which, you know, the accessibility to audiences and tourists that are on on that sidewalk, they can easily walk in and out um, of the, the the museum, right? Um, and and the High Line, and it also gives them opportunities to to look at you know free art, right? Because you you do have to pay to get into the Whitney, but you can just if you were coming off the High Line and you wanted to be on one of these porches, you could actually just look in a gallery and see art. And so it was meant to engage with the public and, and, and give some free um, art viewing to, to people to incite curiosity with all of this glass to, well, hey, maybe we'll, okay, we'll stop. We'll stop at the Whitney real quick um, while we are you know, on our way. Um, and also very trying to integrate itself very seamlessly in other projects around that are similarly trying to engage community um, a little bit more. And so that's the architecture, right? We have two examples of how our, the architecture itself is trying to move away from that very restrictive design. But let's think about well, uh, the actual narrative itself, right? The, the actual artworks that reside inside museums. How, how are museums trying to change this top-down narrative of the curators are talking to you and saying that you need to learn this and, and just assuming that um, we, we don't know anything or that our, our opinions don't matter. Well, museums um, in, you know, recently, in, in the past few decades, they they have um, art education departments that are very very important to um, the the curation. Usually, art education and curators really talk to each other and thinking about how you just can't slap um, a narrative on the wall. You need to figure out a way to make it and the a learning a more engaging learning experience that creates wonder and creates. Um, interpretation and creativity in audiences. And so sometimes you will have in galleries that have like really good art education um, components. And I've, and I've been to the Denver Art Museum is actually really good um, if you've ever been for this, where they will have like this very highbrow, you know, uh, narrative on the wall, but then they'll have this really cool interactive element um, that just makes the art seem so much better. And you feel like you're actually engaging with it instead of just watching it. Also, museums have art education um, classrooms where, where they have, they usually have programming, free programming for usually uh, you know children, but also young adults, you know, and elder and elderly people, individuals uh, that is some, that is related to a current exhibition. And so you know you can make your own art, um, et cetera. You can paint. And that's, that is a way in which, um, you know, our education's mission is to broaden and enrich an experience for youth, adults, and families, right? Making it more of a interactive experience. And then also museums um, have uh, made specific, uh, they've actually commissioned large scale installation works within their their gallery spaces or it may be incorporated in the design itself that is very immersive and so here's a key word for us today immersive art you all have probably experienced this in some way uh shape or form 
of an element uh, within a building, such as here, we, we are looking at a, an image um, taken from the floor, right? So we have, you, you, you are asked to lay on the floor and the, the, the ceiling is a mirror. And in that way, you, you, you can't see, right, everything that this large installation is doing, right? You don't see the lights, you don't see the shapes, unless you immerse yourself in it, unless you say, okay, I'm going to you know, lay down, relax, and I can take a picture, right, and put myself inside this artwork. Once again, very much sparking wonder and excitement. These sort of immersive art projects uh, are, are a big draw for audiences. For example, um, when uh, the Broad Museum in LA first opened, it was they they had this immersive mirror filled uh, room with lights, and it was super popular. People were lined up around the block to go in and take pictures of themselves in it post on social media and of course they had hashtags related to it and that's the whole idea is it's trying to immerse you in not only this artwork you're putting yourself in it and you want to engage with it instead of being forced to engage with it but also it's it being this large installation within the actual art space you have you you have a different perception of the rest of the museum you, you, you think oh i had so much fun downstairs doing this I'm going to you know, take that sense of wonder and fun to the other galleries. And then you also have these types of immersive uh, art installations. Perhaps maybe you went to Immersive Van Gogh. Maybe you've been to Meow Wolf in, 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 the, in Santa Fe area. So, the same sort of thing. But now we are moving out of the museum. Usually these types of projects are in large industrial spaces because it's all about projecting images or in the case of Meow Wolf, having these rooms and different corridors um, and large installations. But just thinking about immersive Van Gogh, which tours around um, the country, um, or, or at least it did, going into these, renting out these uh, industrial spaces for a time and immersing audiences in in a, in, a, in a particular artwork so this the, the the paintings of Vincent van Gogh and this I find very interesting uh, just a topic to think is that now we are asking audiences to fully immerse themselves in art and in, in artwork but now we are not in a art museum these types of projects are even saying maybe we don't need museums maybe this is a better way for audiences to really get a sense of art. Um, and notice it's not one narrative, it's one artist and you don't see texts on the walls. It's all about your movement. You are, the, the audience member is the prime subject. You are, you are asked to play, you are asked to move around and not being asked to move around in a particular way. You have your own free will to do that. And with each step, there's something new to see. The, the images are changing. And so the, 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 I find these extremely fascinating and, and perhaps you do as well. And then lastly, for this episode, um, gallery spaces and museum spaces, you know, they, they very much are competing with, <laughs> competing with these types of, of um, these uh, programs, because these are usually private companies who put these on, right? And as you know, public engaging uh, institutions, museums, they, they want also to, to draw visitors in through this idea of immersion. And something that uh, a lot of museums do, this, this is a, an exhibition um, from 2008 from uh, the San Francisco MoMA about the art of par participation. It was a, a little bit of a uh, historical look at this, this type of art of, that really wants to engage audiences, uh, really incorporate audiences into the actual art, the production of art itself within the gallery. And it put on a retrospective that was meant to present every object as something that you can add to. You can, so I love this one right here, where it, uh, you have a typewriter and you, audiences can type whatever they want and 
it just adds to this continuous paper, right? Or you can talk into a microphone and see your voice being translated into colors and uh, different types of digital effects. And so partici participation art right, is a more responsive to communities that cultural uh, institutions serve. And this type of art is very popular for museums to, to have in their galleries. Um, a, lot of, a lot of these artworks are also seeking to preserve the voices of audiences. So something like this, right? This, this is an artwork. This is not going to be thrown away. This is now forever um, ingrained in this artwork within the collection. And so in a way, your voice, your heritage, whatever, wherever you come from, you know, your community, your whatever you want to say or contribute is now being part of the of the collecting process, which is totally different from what we talked about earlier about how the collecting process was very removed from communities. These are things that have been collected over time, right? Um, from all over the world. And so hopefully you guys see um, that some of the changes that museums want to do, but I'm going to leave you with uh, that, that question, right? I, uh, participation art, immersive art is very fun. I, I really like it and you, you, probably, you, you probably like it as well um, because you feel in control. Do you think uh, that this is all that museums need to do because there is this uh, I, uh, idea that just make it interactive, make it immersive, and we don't really, we've done our work, right? The, these other things that we've talked about, about how narratives are constructed, uh, about the history of European art and American art versus other art from around the world. Is participation all that needs to be done? and open-ended and um, hopefully uh, you guys have thoughts and I'd love to hear it.